Uh, my name is Adam. Uh, my moniker de jour is Java Man. Uh, you can call me anything you want. I don't really care. Um, let's see, uh, we're not here to sell anything. So we'll, we'll end on time. Um, let's see, my areas. Uh, generally, my, uh, I spent five years studying hardware design and uh, concentrated mostly in digital signal processing, communications, and uh, modulation type issues. Uh, now most of my work has been research in uh, computer network uh, architectures, computer network protocols, and uh, most of my hardware design development stuff has been in uh, RF hardware uh, communication systems. And uh, now I'm just getting back to like, you know building stuff on my own, again, outside of industry. Um, I noticed that nothing really takes the fun out of something than doing it for a living. And uh, I'm sure it's probably true for many people here. Uh, so if there's uh, any questions along those lines, uh, we can answer. And uh, I'm also going to pass it over to uh, uh, Nick first, and he'll introduce himself, talk about some things he works on, and uh, we'll pose a few questions. and. Uh, just to get the, the ball rolling, and then uh, we'd like uh, people to start raising their hands with uh, questions that they may uh, have, uh, uh, you know, kicking around. Son? Okay. Um, I'm Binary. Uh, I'm here to help uh, Adam with any telecom questions. I work for a large telecom equipment manufacturer. I have about six years' experience in the telecom industry and the general uh, wide area networking technology, so I've been in electronics ever since I was very little, and I'm just here to help out with that. And uh, uh, Nick's being a little too modest, uh, he works a lot in uh, uh, SS7 switching, uh, circuit switching systems, uh, you know, telephones, and, uh, and topics along those lines. So, uh, okay, all right, all right. Uh, so my first question, how many people, this is a good one, how many people think that there's an infinite amount of bandwidth out there? And the only reason why uh, people don't have very high data rate uh, uh, systems is because of the FCC. I think it's a, a good question. I want to get a show of hands. Don't be shy. Everyone who believes this, raise your hands. Come on, there's going to be more people than this. If it's a really big number, I know. But I want to get a show of hands. And it's, it's very important for me that I get a show of hands on this one. Just curious. We have eh, not, not too many people. We have a few. All right. Uh, and that's, that's patently false because, yes, I'm telling you, it's a big number. And uh, the only reason why I ask this question is because uh, I read Slashdot every so often, and I truly believe that Slashdot rots your brain. And is uh, and the, the, the range of stupidity I see come out of that area, I, I, it boggles the mind, and uh, sometimes I just want to roll my eyes back in my head and, and go to sleep forever. <laughs> And not too long ago, there, I'll do it right now, watch. Uh, and not too long ago, there was an article that said uh, that, uh, that all these technologies coming out, which say that, which just increase bandwidth, and that bandwidth is going to be infinite, and the only thing that's stopping this is the, uh, is, is the FM uh, radio industry and, uh, and the TV industry who won't prevent the, uh, the average Joe from, from getting it, so they so they'll defeat their, their, their monopoly on communications. That's bullshit, <laughs> all right? It, it's, that's the bottom line. Um, there was very fundamental work done by a very, very brilliant man by the name of Claude Shannon, done in the late 40s. And he is the founder of what's called information theory. Well, really fan, I, him and Norbert Wiener were two people who really pushed this, this, this uh, uh, theory forward. And he actually laid down what is fundamental mathematical relation, which defines a maximum capacity for any channel. He said the maximum capacity for a channel was related to bandwidth and a logarithm of the signal noise ratio. And what this said was that if there is absolutely no noise in a channel, zero noise, SNR is, you know, it's none, none whatsoever, yes, you have infinite bandwidth. The chance of having zero noise, the chance of having zero noise is zero. Noise comes from quantum uh, fluctuations in uh, devices, thermal noise, uh, large number of things like that. Um, and what ends up happening is that this noise will uh, kind of cloud your vision. So imagine taking, um, uh, looking at, uh, okay, good example, go to the optometrist, okay, and there's a sheet of letters, you know, I mean, you have to read those letters, and you get down towards the bottom line, as they get smaller, those letters, 
you're able to fit more of them on the line. You should be able to read more of them. Let's say you take a, a sheet of wax paper and put it in front of it. That, that line gets even a little bit more blurry. And you're able to still pick out most of the symbols and read them, but it still gets harder and harder. As you increase the number of sheets of wax paper in front of that, uh, that, you know, that autonomous sign, it becomes near impossible to differentiate those symbols. That's what noise really is in a communication channel. If there is zero noise, you can pack infinitely many symbols uh, be by different, uh, by, uh, different voltage levels, for example, if we're dealing with baseband signaling, into that, into that area. But noise blurs that area between uh, two uh, signaling points. And so what ends up happening is that it's very difficult to actually make that distinction between different, uh, different voltage levels. And uh, just the same way it would be if you have, like, you know, uh, some kind of haze in front of, uh, in front of a large number of uh, letters in a row that you're trying to differentiate. Now, technology such as spread spectrum, uh, they say, oh, yeah, it increases all your bandwidth. Well, the real reason why people use spread spectrum is more for multiple access technologies. Uh, basically, uh, the way you're able to, instead of having people change what frequency they're on, you take their signal, which may be 100 hertz, or 100, um, let's say it's one kilohertz wide, and you mix it in with a, a square wave, which runs at 100 times higher rate than your symbol rate of your channel. So your signal becomes 100 kilohertz wide. That doesn't mean they really have more bandwidth as in the idea of um, data rate transmission. They, their signal takes up more bandwidth, but the reason why is because you have different uh, square waves, different signaling codes, the two signals can can, co can occupy the same channel space at the same time. That doesn't mean that you know you're getting bandwidth for free. You just took one guy's one kilohertz and jacked up to you know 100 times larger without getting any additional data. And the other person is occupying the same space. And the reason why you do this is a couple a couple reasons. You get um, what's called a uh, oh crap. I can't remember the exact. They, they can't remember a technical name for it. But basically, what happens is that if you have a single uh, noise point. Uh, when you apply the despreading code, it, uh, it, it flushes out the noise. It uh, spreads out the noise. Uh, I think it's called like time-space gain. Um, you also get that, and also on the opposite end of your receiver, you have one receiver chain, and you break it out into multiple uh, 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 multiple uh, paths of, uh, of demodulation, and you just mix in these different despreading codes. So you have like one front-end amplifier and able to just do spread on different frequencies rather than having to have uh, different receivers each have a separate frequency. It's actually a very convenient way of doing system design. Is For questions, so you can use the mic yeah. right there. Is this similar to the way is this similar to the way that cable modems work over the same line that your cable television runs over? Uh, that's something a little bit separate. Uh, that's just uh, frequency division multiplexing. What I'm talking, where basically all your cable TV occupies one frequency space, and all your uh, data data rates occupy another data space, and that's exactly what happens with DSL. DSL lines is uh, voice is between zero and three kilohertz, and DSL is between like uh, ten kilohertz and twenty megahertz, something along those lines. That's why you put the line filters on your phone when you get DSL. Is to keep you know all the extra DSL signals off your other, you know, off your other phones. Uh, and DSL actually, I'll get back to that. But DSL is uh, uh, this is why the cable companies are going to beat out the telco companies because DSL is a really a, a bad hack. Uh, and, and well, I shouldn't say a bad hack. It's a great hack, but it's a hack. And the only and the lines are designed to carry that wide of a signal path. And once you start getting a large number of customers in the area, all the lines are bleeding into each other, and your DSL data rates go down. So. Uh, additionally, you can't be more than three miles from a telco. The reason why is because the cables physically can't carry that much data. It's like trying to run a um, good example. Uh, it's like trying to take really bad twisted pair and run a uh, gigabit Ethernet over it. It's just the channel's not high enough quality. So that's I mean it's pretty much exactly what the phone, the, the DSL systems are. But uh, uh, let's just get to your question in a second. And uh, what I'm talking about spread spectrum is referred to as co-division multiple access CDMA phones. This is how they operate. So maybe we should start taking questions and use it. Come on. In line with the most recent question, the cable companies are considering using phone access over the cable lines. Yes, they could. They put it this way: the phone companies have three kilohertz, three kilohertz channels to everyone's house. The cable companies rolled out 
analog systems, which provide, I think, up to a gigahertz, uh, like one gigahertz wide channel to everyone's house. Cable companies have a sunk cost already in their infrastructure of very wide channels to everyone's house. The phone companies have three kilohertz. The only way that I can see the phone companies beating these people out is they start laying out fiber at one's house, and that's just expensive. I mean, so it's it's just a matter of who put in the infrastructure first. I mean, they're doing it. Is this new development? Uh, I guess they've been doing it now for about the past five years. I mean, is your housing complex a new zone? How long ago was your house built? Uh, my house was built in 1995. All right. So there's houses in Oregon now in Miami mm -hmm. laying out fiber boxes. Right, that fiber goes to something called a remote terminal, and then that gets changed over to your twisted pair, and it right. goes back to your house. That's how DSL is being deployed now, where they're, they're finding that the, the distance limitations is causing them to basically put a diesel in every network, in every neighborhood. So that, that's just a, an effort to push it further, push the CO, so to speak, further closer to the customer. But still, the cost of actually going through and drop and and it's actually trenching costs uh, of putting a fiber at one's house is just too expensive. And it's not the actual cost of the fiber, really; it's the cost of labor. So that that's actually the biggest cost by far of any networking technologies. The actual price you have to pay uh, the people who actually go out and dig the trenches and, and actually lay a line. It's not the, the actual cable technology. But, <laughs> yeah, but I don't think uh, the gas company would be glad when you, you know, drop a shovel right into one of their gas lines that to come out and, and fix it. I mean, you, you have to do these things in a, not, not as much in a centralized manner, but in an organized manner. Yeah, I mean, you can't have everyone going out and digging up the street and laying down their own fiber cables. <laughs> Yeah, but still. About which? Well, they're, they're running fiber to each neighborhood to deploy remote terminals or slits to service your phones who are a PSL and other services that they're planning to roll out. And I mean, fiber to, the, to your house really doesn't make sense. There's just not that much bandwidth out there, even if you did have that big of a pipe. Uh, excuse me? Right. We're, we're only getting half the conversation in the back, so if you can either repeat the question or make them use the mic, so we can all participate. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we asked people to use the mic, but for now I'll repeat the question. I feel chastised. Well, why, don't, why, don't, why don't people walk up to the mic? Yeah. So uh, everyone walk up to the mic for now on. Or else. We send you to France. We were talking about laying fiber to housing complexes, apartments, whatever. I live in Houston. Warner Cable runs fiber up to some point. That, you know, everybody's provided with cable modem access within the range of Time Warner communications through Roadrunner. This is not what you're talking about. Your cable modem actually is delivered via fiber up to a certain point, and it's brought back to the head end. So. It, the re a remote terminal can be many different things. It could be your transceiver for your uh, cable access. It could be a slit for serving phone lines or digital lines. Um, it could be a DSLAM for DSL services. Um, Sprint, I don't know if you've ever heard of Sprint Ion. It, uh, it was a project that failed. They were trying to deploy um, voice over DSL to everybody's house. Everybody would get two phone lines and a high-speed DSL line. And they actually had to run fiber to all these neighborhoods and install a DSLAM, go out, have a truck roll, go and install CP equipment in everybody's house. And it was just taking too long and not that many people were signing up. But still, in order to serve everybody, to get everybody DSL or everybody cable modems, they have to get your high-speed pipes out past the CO infrastructure and into the neighborhood. And then from there, it splits off. Actually, uh, that reminds me of something else. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about dark fiber, uh, that, that there's a huge amount of fiber infrastructures laid out there that's just not even lit. Uh, the reason for this is because, again, the trench costs are so high. They say, you know what, we're going to do this once, and we're not going to, have to, we're not going to be able to do this again for another 50 years or something like that, or another 30 years. So what they're doing is laying out huge amounts of fiber in case they say, oh, well, in case we fill the capacity of our fiber channels as it is. Um, People are going out and they're developing very, very 
dense uh, modulation techniques for fiber. I know that um, Sprint, I you think. DWDM? Yeah, Sprint runs like I think 100 colors. It's moving to 40 colors, I believe, or maybe 100 colors. When I mean 100 colors, I mean 100 separate, or 40 or 100 separate laser channels in one fiber. Wavelengths. Different, yeah, different. You can think of it as colors because that's what different wavelengths are at the, at the optical domain. They're running, you know, between, I think they're right now 40 and they're going to 100, or they're just going to 40 now. Uh, different wavelengths down single fiber, and they only run at 25% capacity. Actually, I think most of the time they even run far, far less because there really is a glut of bandwidth in the core. People just, there's so much bandwidth in the, in the network core, it's not even funny. Question? I'm not going to walk. I'm sitting right next to him. Since <laughs> <laughs> fiber tends to be very expensive to take all the way down to the end point where the customer is located, do you think that wireless is a simple and, and inexpensive solution to make that last mile stretch? It's not the fiber that's expensive, it's the labor cost. Right. But okay, wireless. but I think, yes, yes. Well, I think wireless is, but there's only so much sky. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, if I think that wireless is, a, is an effective way of doing it, and I think that you're actually going to first see it crop up in uh, India or Africa. Uh, they're actually starting to do wireless local loops over there. And the reason why is because, um, in a way, these countries are, I don't want to say lucky, but there's a, the term was used when this, after the Soviet Bolshevik re Revolution, and it was called the, the, uh, the reward of backwardness. And what happened was that uh, the United States in the 1930s were just getting over, we're, we're right in the Depression, and we're saddled with all this industrial equipment. Uh, the Russia, when they went to, uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution, moved from an agrarian society to an industrialized society and bought all new machine equipment. And because of that, they were, I mean, they were pretty much, they were very much capable and, and getting to be ahead of the United States because they were able to buy a whole mess of brand new stuff. And it really is this price of backwardness. And a good example is that when, um, uh, I don't want to say when, but uh, North Korea is probably going to, I don't know, Eventually, North Korea and South Korea will probably become unified again. And what's going to happen is that because North Korea is so poor for so long, and they're going to start rolling out, you know, phone lines to everyone, they're just going to roll out uh, fiber to everyone's house. So you're going to see, you know, and, and being that te South Korea is so industrial, it goes sec it's so technological and so industrialized, one reunification probably will happen. You're going to see North Korea become one of the tech centers of the world because it's just to be saddled with brand new hardware. Uh, Mike, uh, you want his home? Pass the mic back to him? I don't know. This guy doesn't like that. <laughs> Actually, serious. <laughs> Dude, I can't. I really can't hear you. Uh, I, I just want to take um, a second to get away from this mic. Um, I just want to take issue with your economic analysis. I mean, when it comes down to it, the Soviet Union didn't have any advantage by starting as a peasant country. North Korea is not going to have any advantage starting from scratch when it has zero uh, experience picking market participants. I mean, their chance of getting it right the first time out is like, I'm, I'm just using the terms that the historian used. I understand. The historians used. And uh, I'm not saying North Korea is going to get it right the first time. I think South Korea's government is going to run things right. I think that's happening in Eastern, Eastern Germany. And they're starting to build new infrastructure. They're getting more advanced infrastructure than what's already in place in Germany. That's the bottom line. I mean, it's like, but this way, they, they run a lot of technology over there. And it's, you know, at some date N. And then they have to build out a whole new country of technology at some date N plus 10. Well, you know. N plus 10 is greater than N, and it's not going to give them the old technology, it's going to give them the newest stuff. Well, you, you can use um, Japan as an example. I mean, Japan has 3G wireless phones, almost no common channel signaling in their infrastructure, and they were just, because they've had to buy new equipment and roll it out, I don't know if it's so much experience in picking the, the people that are going to build that network out. I mean, there's only a handful of those, and they're all well experienced. Uh, actually, Japan's a real good example. Japan's got bad big problem with fiber infrastructure. And what it is, because, um, all right, fiber technologies. Uh, fiber optics uh, are a lot like wireless channels. They actually have a lot of the same characteristics in that um, you see first order, second order distortions, and things like that. Uh, they call it dispersion in fiber. 
and it's from uh, being a limited bandwidth and, and impurities of fiber. And someone came up with zero dispersion fiber. And they thought this was going to be the greatest thing in the world, and Japan just rolled it out all over the place. And what turned out happening was that when you have zero dispersion fiber, you still have the second and third order characteristics, which limit your capacity to channel. So the United States, what they do is they do uh, one run of uh, a partial run of uh, one kind of dispersion and another partial run of another kind of dispersion fiber, and they cancel each other out. So what happens is we're getting better fiber infrastructure than the Japanese. But that's just because they, you know, they rushed the rush the rollout, you know, fiber before before people really understood what it was capable of engineering. Got okay, another question over there. Uh, companies that market laser transmission lines claim that they're the ultimate solution to the last mile problem in the urban environment. Can you comment on that? Uh, we have one. I'm a graduate student at Drexel University, and we just acquired um, Hahnemann University. It's now our School of Medicine, and we have a, we have a, a gigabit line of sight laser connection, and when it gets foggy out, it, the bandwidth drops. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know, I, I think that I, any technology along these lines, I think is great. Anyone who's developing stuff like that, I think it's great because it, it, fosters, it fosters competition, it, it challenges people. I think that, you know, I mean, really, <laughs> when it comes down, the reason why everyone's got high-speed connections in everyone's houses is pornography <laughs> and, and the web. <laughs> no, you know, the internet. Pornography, pornography drives technology. The reason why VH <laughs> and it's not, I'm not even, I, I wish I was joking. You know why? Beta was a superior technology to VHS. The reason why VHS, everyone's got VHS, well, you know, had VHS VCRs in their house and now they have DVD. And the reason why is because uh, VHS tapes were cheaper to shoot on. So all these people who are, you know, making pornography decide to shoot on VHS tapes because they're cheaper, and people want to watch porn who are buying VHS VCRs. <laughs> all right. Now I think, for all I know, the reason why DVD is so popular is because of, because of multi-angle porn. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, once I'm, I'm telling you, once they figure out how to get boobies in space, we're going to have cheap launch technologies. Once they figure out a good way of looking at porno on like a little LCD panel, we'll all have like you know high data rate to our handsets. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> so, any questions? I'm sorry, I made a woman leave. <laughs> There's one over. Here. Okay. Uh, can you comment, or do you have any any knowledge on uh, 802.16? 802. Which technology is that? Is it right, uh, like it's 802.11 BA, but it just. Uh, 16, which is supposed to be the, the next the, big it's, thing. It's added to 11B, then A, then G. And G is supposed to be backwards compatible with B and operating the same frequency in the range. I thought 16 was Bluetooth or 17 is Bluetooth. It, it miles just miles. did something. What was that? Last mile. Last mile 16? I really don't know. I'm not familiar with the actual protocol spec. And uh, can you, um, I don't know if it's uh, any of your experience or knowledge, um, but uh, the difference between CDMA and GPLS, uh, why is it still that wireless technology on, on a cell phone is so low uh, with the, ca the data capacity? The, da uh, okay. um, the data capacity, the technology is there to go very high data rates on cell phones. The reason why uh, the technology is not there just yet is because of economic reasons. It takes time to roll these things out. And there's no, there's no demand for people to have high data rate on their phones. Again, if there's some way to get porno on your phone, then, then, then they would want it. I mean, it's one hand and the other hand somewhere else. <laughs> and, and, and for the love of God, I mean, I don't want to see someone on the subway doing that. Um, Again, it's existing infrastructure, whereas we have an existing um, CDMA infrastructure, where other countries, a small country that are just deploying that technology, will just go with the latest thing. Why and spend all this money when we have something that already works? And the reason why the Japanese have rolled out this technology so fast is that their population density is so high. If you roll out a single 3G cell, be able to you know service far more people. That's one. And number two, the reason why you actually went from TDM or from um, from amps to TDMA to CDMA is you're able to squeeze three customers in for every one amps customer. And for every CDMA, you're able to squeeze three CDMA customers in practically for every one TDMA customer. So what happens is that for one cell site, um, you, the cell company purchases a cell site for, for a lot of dollars. They drop it into a place until the point where uh, they'll run that cell 
and they'll run it for as many years until the, the cost of making a phone call is less than the cost of electricity and the, and the telco service that sell. And that's, that's all they care about. And if they're able to get six customers in for a spot of every one customer before, that's all the more power to them because they're able to make, you know, it's more of a cash cow And that's the reason why I really, really went from TDMA to CDMA and uh, uh, out of amps. And it wasn't because, you know, it's better quality or anything like that. And I'll be honest, I kind of think that amps usually, or TDMA, when it, be, when it first coming out, it's kind of the worst because, you know, you're right at the fringe of coverage and digital uh, noise is much harder to, for the human ear to, to fix than, than analog old noise. It's what it is. It's, it's. I think a CDMA is not even your own voice. It's just a vocoder, and basically, it's a model of your own. It's a model of your vocal track, and yeah. I mean, it sounds like. Can you the repeat the is, question. The point is, you're able to. Oh, the question was. Uh, it, well, it wasn't really a question of a comment. He said the amps always sounds far better than CDMA or TDMA, and the reason why is because, I mean, it's just it's 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 a vocoder and it's digitized and it's doing a reconstruction. That's I mean, it's not as much for the noise issues, but the fact that they're able to squeeze six people in for every one channel. Actually, in China, the CDMA systems they they jack in far more people into the CDMA signal than they do over here. So it really sounds like crap over there, but they will get more you know more customers on it. I have a question. Uh, it's, a, it's just a technical question. Yes. Uh, I have a CDMA phone from Verizon, and... I don't know uh, how to program it. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was told by Verizon that I could get 140 kilobits per second if I buy their expensive uh, internet kit, and uh, a lot of my friends disagree with me, and they say that I probably couldn't get anywhere near that. Uh, what's your opinion on that? As a CDMA phone? Yeah, they said uh, 140 kilobits per second. Did you serve it? I mean, assuming I'm getting good reception. I didn't, I didn't think that CDMA will actually will go up that because like CDMA vocoders oscillate between 2400 baud and 2880. I thought they might use some kind uh, of data or something. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they could probably do it because there's enough, there's enough single space out there to do it, but I don't think they're going to be able to roll out to a lot of customers because there just isn't that much channel capacity. But if you wanted to do your vocoder over that 120 kilobits per second, it would sound really good. It would sound really great audio. Yeah. There's a question over here. Uh, well, wait, pass the mic. <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll send it over to this guy over here. I think this gentleman, did you have a question? Yeah, I just have an answer to the previous guy. In Korea, they have about 10 million customers with uh, CDMA 1X, and uh, the, throughput, the throughput on a 144K connection is uh, about 60 or 70 real um, it's not real data rates, which is great. I mean, better than, better than dial up. Um, so it works, it exists. Um, who knows if it's going to make it work? But that's yeah, and I think I think part of it's also um, it will work great in '99 when everyone had laptops and companies expensing their cell phones. But now, I, I mean, this is why everyone's like, oh well, you know, they, people broke the ricochet network. Well, maybe part of the reason why ricochet network does mm -hmm. exist isn't going to be successful right now is because there's not a lot of people whose companies will expense a ricochet modem. I mean, and uh, what about the security of? Uh, CDMA phone. Somebody says landline phone is more secure than uh, cell phone. Some other people say cell phone is more secure than landline phone. I mean, uh, for somebody else to overhear your conversation on the phone. Um, I know at least TDMA phones you can throw into sometimes the bug mode and sit there and listen to other people's conversations. If a cell is able to negotiate with a, if a cell is able to negotiate with a phone, then then someone else someone else is able to make that negotiation. That's really what it comes down to. If it's a random code, but you know. Nothing's impossible. Uh, whether or not one's more secure than another, let's look at the reality of it. I don't think you have to worry about it. I mean, the, the, the probability of something being within, you know, hearing range of your phone, which is actually pretty small, because those things are in, you know, I think about 180 milliwatts max on most handsets. But, I mean, which is, a, it's only like maybe, a, I don't know, a half a mile radius, depending on, like, if you're in an urban environment. Chance someone being in that range listening to you while you actually read off your credit card number is, you know, pretty slim. I won't worry about it too much. No, I mean, but still, how many people are sitting there, you know, listening to your cell phone conversation? There are people who have more things to do in their lives than this. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised every day at these things. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, but also they have to sit there and they have to sit there and build all the custom hardware to, to sit there and demodulate the And also, listen, to, and pick your one conversation out of everyone else's. I'm just talking about practicalities, okay? If someone wants to listen to your phone call or someone wants to follow you around, they're going to follow you around and listen to your phone calls. <laughs> all right, that's, there's not shit you're going to be able to do about it. Right, right. Yeah, all the same transmission after the tower. Talking about CDMA phones, but uh, what about the GSM? Is that any better, or any worse? And yeah. what do you think the chances are of GSM spreading in the U.S. as opposed to CDMA or something like that? Um, it's all about 3G now, and um, because of a patent fight involving Qualcomm, the United States and I want to say Japan, but not, it's the United States in our country. I think it might just be the United States. They're rolling out one technology, the CDMA 2000. The rest of the world's rolling out our technology, WCDMA. And um, until I don't know why they're doing it. I think it's really it really comes into a patent fight, and also it's a part of American culture that we don't have to interoperate with anyone else because we're in the United States. Until the United States really admits that it's more part of the world economy, they're not we're not going to have a global cellular system. This is a, this is economics. It's not it's not technology motivated. Sorry, it's just a hassle. You got to go anywhere else. You have to have a GSM phone or rent one, or you know. It's. I mean, yeah. But the thing is, the number of Americans who, or the fraction of Americans who are who have to travel overseas and get in our phone and do business overseas, compared to. I mean, if that fraction starts increasing dramatically, then yes, the cell phone companies are definitely going to roll it out because there'll be an economic demand. So much of technology is driven by economics. It's well, it's all driven by economics. That's the bottom line. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, questions. Is there any hardware? I mean, there's, there's a lot of wireless questions. It's good. I mean, I got no problem with it. Is there any other questions on our topics? You're more than welcome to, to ask them. Uh, I have a question on 802.11b. Uh, um, um, I heard that you can put an amplifier uh, in line there to uh, increase the power output. Uh, how does the switching of that work? Uh, does the amplifier itself do the switching between receive and transmit? Yeah, you would, you would I, have I'm to still have thinking of the old linear amplifier model from ham radio. That's why I'm wondering yeah, how it's, it's, you, um, you don't have, I mean, it's, it's not that much power. You have, it's like 30, 50 watts. You can do it with a pin diode. Oh, yeah. so, so you come in, you, you're, you come into your, your chain, you have a pin diode, and you switch over to your amplifier, and you flip over the other end, and you have a, a, an LNA on a reverse pin. Okay, so uh, there's no need for a mechanical TR okay. switch. Okay. We have really high power off electronics nowadays. I mean, really have this, put it this way, I'm, I'm a ham radio operator too, and also I work in the the, uh, the cell industry. And the shit that the cell industry has compared to the amateur radio operators is a disgrace. I mean, the ham radio operators are so far behind, it's not even funny. Can you put my hands up? Uh, one sec. I mean, yeah, it, but, but for power levels, nowhere near them. Even if you get the cell systems compatible, you're still going to need a different cell phone. The frequency allocations are different in different parts of the world. So your cell phone isn't ever going to be transportable. I'm sorry, what is that? You have different frequency allocations in different parts of the world. The frequencies are set up differently. Even if your system is compatible, it's going to be on a different frequency. There are There is international agreements upon frequency allocations done by the ITU. And it wouldn't be that much of a challenge for everyone to agree on a, on a frequency set because there's already the infrastructure in place for people to do it. So if they really wanted to have global phones, they could have them. Uh, question. I've helped a couple of friends, a few friends over the last couple of years, get like four or five DSL connections set up. and. We've been in a constant battle with Verizon, getting the right lingo down, talking about things like bridge taps and uh, digital carriers to get our line clean enough to get a DSL connection on there. Can you provide some insight as to what a line needs to have technically in order to qualify for DSL so that we can speak the right language when we can actually get a hold of tech? I don't know what language the tech people speak, and sometimes I don't think it's English. Well, what uh, type of DSL service were you trying to get? is the first question, because there's many different types and they all have different line characteristics that are required. ADSL, SDSL, TDSL. ADSL? Yeah, that's the Yeah, I believe ADSL is, what, 28,000 feet? Yeah, I think so. Okay. On traditional um, copper phone networks, you had things, load coils, bridge taps, um, 
really archaic uh, rotting cable, basically. And all of these, um, these problems with the line will um, it can be shorted, it can be wet, it can be brought to ground. There's um, acceptance tests that the phone company will do, and they can tell you if you have a bridge tap or a load coil. Load coils were used to try to balance the impedance for incredibly long uh, lengths of uh, transmission cable. Um, okay. Do you, do you know where your CO is? Like how far away yeah, are you? Away? We're like about three quarters of a mile there. So you shouldn't have any problem. They're giving you a hard time. Yeah. Check your house. Okay. It, it, it's not do you live in our old house in an apartment building? No, it's, it's, it's four years old. Four years old. And they're giving you. A yeah, this is. I've been through this four or five times. One time we had a digital carrier. Then I moved again. And then it's, the thing. it's like it's something new every time. So. Yeah. Hi. No yeah, there's just no reason for three quarters of a mile no. that you shouldn't be able to. Yeah. No, and you, you know, you should, the bottom line is this. Mm -hmm. You should tell them, do you want my money? Do you want my, you know, I'm being serious. They, their goal no, is no. to Sorry. acquire money from you and your goal is to You're acquire service. And you have to go up to and say, look, I am willing to give you $50 a month, $80 a month, you know, whatever their fee is, in order to get high data rate. The end. All right. Do you want to give me that data rate? If you don't want to give me that data rate, I'll find some other way. You lose that eight hours a month. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. One possible thought, if you're trying to get your DSL from a company other than your local Bell operating company, a lot of times they will try to make it difficult for you and claim they can't do it. You then contact them and tell them you want it from them. They magically find a way to make the line work. It, it, but, that happens a lot with Verizon, at least. I'll, I think other ones too. Yeah, but but so even notorious. Keep even that. even if it does again, you know, then you call the Bear Business Bureau. If you really if you really want to make these people miserable, you can do that. Freak out. Um, we spent a lot of time on DSL and wireless yeah, talk. I, is there any hardware questions? Actually, we all have these nifty little smart card badges. There's nothing in them. <laughs> but but tell us about them. What what can you you know do with them? What what household electronics can I use to peer inside this and put stuff on it? Do something with it. What household electronics? Um, there's been some work to do where they uh, try to read the memory cells by shaving them down. There's, um, people really the people who design these things aren't dumb shits. I mean they no they actually put a lot of effort into trying to make these things secure. I remember like some of the initial ones. Uh, tried photocopying them to try to read the memory cell, they'd, they'd self-destruct. There's a lot of different things that happen. There's a report that came out about this guy in Britain who was able to shave it down so he use a photo flash to read the memory cell structure. Yeah, but that was not like um, really repeatable. He said you could do it within a batch. Like you could destroy several hundred in the process of one batch trying to read the memory cell structure. So they're, they're moderately secure. As in, kind of, I mean, common household structures to, to access them, there's a really good uh, paper on how to uh, attack these things, and basically it looked at external characteristics, such as you, you examine the supply voltage uh, used. So let's say um, before it authenticates, most of the circuit's off and may draw five milliamps. And uh, as you try to authenticate against the card, uh, until it authenticates, it'll, t you know, it'll still draw five milliamps. And once it authenticates, it draws 20 milliamps, for example. <laughs> so what you do is just watch the power structure. And I think that's one of the more creative ways of going about accessing these things. Uh, there's one in the back. All right, and we'll come up here, then over here. Uh, yes, just a small hardware question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does anybody here know where I can find a 27C512 Amtel chip? 27. Have you tried Mauser? Or uh, not yet. 100 Digikey. 100. 1 800 Digikey. Oh, Digikey nice. will deliver the next day. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. I had good luck uh, ordering chips from Radio Shack. Yeah, no, just go to Digikey. Mauser and Digikey are an engineer's best friend. There. Uh, also, try calling for samples. Say that you're uh, developing, right over here, this, this gentleman, uh, then back that way. Uh, if you're saying that you're doing a large spin of uh, systems, saying, uh, I'm such and such engineer, such and such company, we're developing this product, uh, I'm going to have to get some samples of this device, we're comparing it to this and this, uh, you know. And then usually what happens will send it to you, then you get some phone calls from the sales staff and say, oh, we chose not to use it. But no, I mean, no, I mean this is, 
you had to do this in the industry, this helped people operate because you have to get the components fast. You can't wait for the, you know, so turn them over. But Digikey is really fast with stuff. Uh, what device or the hardware I need for recording my own cell phone conversation? Recording your own cell phone conversation? Yes. It depends on what you're working with. I mean, if you're working with amps, just a, a scanner. If you're working with TDMA, uh, there's an Ericsson phone. It's like the Ericsson web phone. There's a way of, uh, uh, there's a way you can throw it into bug mode. You can listen to each channel. If you're working with CDMA, the specialized equipment. They test that, yeah. Uh, there's a question back here. Maybe we got to send up this guy. Actually, you know, what? is there anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? We'll, we'll give preferential, you know, service to them. I uh, I've heard that x86 has some CPU instructions that just didn't get used over the years. Why exactly is that? Um, that could be if they had instructions that haven't been used over the years. Uh, that could be because of compiler designers. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It, it, the compiler, if you think about it in a way, the architecture people define what instructions are capable, like uh, MMX, for example. I remember when MMX came out. It was like, oh, it's going to be a big, be a big speed increase. But until the compiler designers develop it, they don't, you know, it goes underutilized. Uh, another good example is the G4 has the Altavec processor, which I think is so badass. And it's basically a, uh, it's a vector processor unit, which is something you didn't find unless you got the really high-end processors, usually. And until people write good compilers to utilize them, they'll go underutilized. Uh, this gentleman didn't ask a question yet. On your left. Um, is this on? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, processing, uh, based on like uh, level 2 cache. Uh, in terms of processing, based in on. In terms of processing, uh, with any x86 uh, processor. Mm -hmm. um, What's the highest uh, level amount of uh, level 2 cache have you seen? Because I've seen stuff like, on, for example, on the G4s, I think they use 1 to 4 megs. And everybody on the PC process, you know, uses anywhere from 256, 384, 512. I've seen meg cache, and I think I've seen 2 meg cache. Anymore. I know that this, I'm more of a Spark guy, uh, and I'm where Spark boxes of 8 meg cache. What is it? There's any, this guy saying there's 3 meg Intel cache, and... Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, most for most people, it, it until the customer demands it, yeah, you know, it's not going to appear. But for most people, most people use don't use x86 hardware for scientific computing, so or for having number, number crunching. And most of their number crunching nowadays done with a video card because they play video games, so they don't. You know, it's not as much of a concern for most people. And the people who demand it are like people who do scientific processing or or stuff like that. And that's where you see it. Like on some V880s, you usually have a lot of cash per processor. Back. Oh, yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts were on uh, CG, uh, NVIDIA's uh, new compiler for, you know, using, like, you know, you know, vertex and pixel shaders, and it's like a C-like language, so it's, you know, so this way it doesn't have to be programmed for specifically, you know, like ATI cards or, or uh, um, you know. It's an industry thing. I mean, it's, they're, what they're doing is they're basically saying, um, we're going to write a language so more people will use our hardware. I mean, uh, make people more comfortable using our hardware. That's pretty much what it comes down to. Uh, I mean, whether or not it's a video card word thing, I'll be honest with you. The, I don't really play video games. Um, I, I play some Yahoo games, it's about it. <laughs> but uh, I get motion sick from from like the, the 3D things. But uh, I mean, really why they're coming out those those compiler things is because uh, they're trying to make it easier for programmers to write stuff for their video card. And if people write more software for the video card, people are going to buy more of their video card. So. I've just been told you have time for one more question. Uh, someone who hasn't asked anything yet. Uh, can you comment on the Tempest technology of remotely monitoring a monitor's output, uh, the feasibility of building a custom system? Um, of building your own custom Tempest system? Sure, it's possible. I mean, I don't know how much time you want to spend on it. But uh, it's a lot of optimization stuff. I mean, um, there was an old Heathkit computer that you were able to put a TV next to it, and you would see the exact same thing on the TV as you would on the computer because it, the uh, the same, the V-Sync and the H-Sync bled so much it would bleed into the next the TV next to it. Um, doing it on your own, I don't know. It's it's a good challenge. Uh, sec, let's just get this one last question here. Uh, do you have the microphone? Oh. 
It sounded like you talked about a differential power analysis with the smart cards. Yeah. Um, where you examine and extract the key. Are you aware uh, of any... I was not only extracting a key, just do a brute force attack against the key. Okay. Yeah. But uh, developers are countering that with running like a random number generator while they're doing that. Are you aware of... There's, yeah, they could do that or you could put like a, um, like, a, like a load resistor across it. I mean, it's really a cat and mouse game. Yeah. And it's kind of cool. Are you aware of any other uh, emerging attacks? No, the last thing I heard was someone doing that, that doing an attack with shaving off the surface and using a flash. Okay. That, that's not a, that's not something you attack a specific card with. You attack a make of cards to try to destroy, you know, reverse engineer structure. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know anything now. If you can uh, cut out the back of the card and dissolve it with uh, nitric acid, if you can uh, gain access to like a research lab and use a scanning electron microscope to read the memory. Yeah. You know, you can't, I mean, no, I, I think it, I have got the feeling by the time you read the first couple bits, the last couple bits are going to start getting destroyed from the radiation. I mean, uh, I mean, because they think about it, you're, you're bombarding them with huge amounts of electrons, so you might, you might destroy more data, you might destroy some of the data before you actually get any of it out. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. Oh, okay. Uh, your DSL question to get, uh, if you ask Verizon for a pair change, complain about your modem data rate. They should give you at least one pair change and try to get your DSL provision for that.